everybody. Um, we've got a number of you watching live, so that's fantastic. My name, for those of you that haven't met me yet, haven't watched one of these webinars, my name is Kat Luckock. I'm the host of the Wise Social Enterprise Summit. And it's fantastic that you've signed up to be part of this summit. We've got two weeks of 14 um, special guests talking about a whole range of different topics on Social Enterprise. I'm super pleased today to have Cress Wesling. So hi, Cress. Hi. Am I saying your name right? Because we haven't actually spoken. On them. <laughs> it's Cressy. Cressy. Sorry. That's all right. No, but that's really Thank you much for giving your time to the summit. Um, I know we're going to have a really great conversation. Um, if people want to ask questions as we go through, you can do that in the chat box. And then if we've got time at the end, um, I'm sure we can ask Cressy some of those questions. That'll be fantastic. Um, so let's get started, if you're ready, Chrissy. Um, so Izzy, the general idea is that I want to give you the story of the business. And, yeah, um, and I'll ask you some questions and then um, we might get some questions from the audience as well. Okay, and is it all right to share photos and images and pictures? Yeah, you should be able to upload um, any pictures a share you've got. Screen option. You can share your screen, exactly. Excellent. So if, yeah, if you want to get started and introduce yourself and the background around Elvis and Crest, and then um, if you've got some pictures and slides and things, and then we can um, ask some questions afterwards. Okay, great. So Elvis and Cressy started in 2005, and the reason that we started was to rescue London's damaged decommissioned fire hoses. And I'm trying to share a screen image of that with you, um, but it might take me a little bit a little bit of time to get that going because I'm not the most tech savvy person in the world. Um, but essentially, we, when I first came to the UK, the problem that I discovered was that a lot of waste was going to landfill and kind of an insensible amount of waste. It was 100 million tons that went that year in the UK alone. And I had no idea what 100 million tons actually looked like. I couldn't really imagine what what that amount was was going to be so i wanted to i certainly wanted to discover more about it and i spent a lot of time going to landfill sites trying to really get to grips with the problem itself and what i i, I discovered along the way was that of course there is the kind of waste that you'd expect there is the nappies and the tennis rackets and things like that but there's also some really incredible um materials that that really really deserve to be rescued. So I think, can you guys see an image? Has an image popped up there? Yeah, it's come up. Excellent. Um, so this is what London's damaged decommissioned fire hoses look like. And of course, you know, when you're looking at waste as kind of an abstract problem, it's really difficult to think about how you might solve it. But when you narrow your focus down to something really, really specific, uh, it becomes, well, still very problematic, but somewhat easier. And what we discovered when we, we found the hose was, was that it was not a huge problem. It's between mm -hmm. three and 10 tons a year. So nothing like 100 million tons, but still a significant problem because fire hose as it is cannot be recycled. Fire hose is a double wall nitrile rubber uh, jacket that sandwiches a woven nylon core and that means you can't shred it melt it and make new hoses so you're stuck with it and it's got some incredible properties it's heat resistant it's water resistant but if it's too damaged to repair so in the middle of a 22 meter hose if you get a catastrophic tear that means that you cannot recycle the hose you cannot use it as a a death as it were and what what our job was was to try and come up with a way to use it to extend beyond that time and what we decided to do with the hose was to turn it into luxury items so here hopefully another image has popped mm -hmm. up for you and the reason that we chose uh, luxury accessories was not because we had always had dreams of being fashion entrepreneurs or luggage makers it was because we came across quite a lot of research at the time that we were really trying to understand what hose was. And one of the interesting pieces of research is that a lot of brands use hose-like material in their collections. So Goyard, Louis Vuitton, they use a, a nitrile rubber, very similar to hose in their, in their monogram collections. And we knew, so we knew we had a material of that quality. Right? That was the first thing that we discovered. The second thing that we discovered was that the luxury industry as a whole had just been evaluated by the World Wildlife Foundation. And they'd looked at it in terms of its environmental and ethical performance. And no brand was scoring above a C plus. 
And we knew we could improve on that quite dramatically. So we thought that, that we could use the hose as this, as this way to create really, really incredible products with amazing longevity and utility, but also challenge the luxury sector because we didn't think it was offering what people expect, you know, especially, you know, this is back in 2005. Um, so, so we were, I think it was much more pioneering when we began. A lot of people have started to, to learn our language now. It's much more commonplace to hear a luxury uh, designer talk about sustainability and talk about eliminating fur and, and, and various issues like this. But in 2005, this was, this was not the language. And the third thing that we do, I suppose that's quite interesting, is that, so if you think the first thing we do is rescue, the second thing that we do is transform, the third thing that we do is we give money away. So 50% of the profits from our fire hose collection goes to the firefighters charity. So we've got this um, method of sort of circular capital. We don't see the point in retaining all of this value for ourselves when when there is a, a real value to sharing it within the community and particularly with our main stakeholders and the and obviously the fire hose comes from the fire service and and it's of great value to us to support the firefighters and what we discovered was was really fascinating is that by doing something extraordinary and something completely unique but also by doing something really good that people could sense sense a moral underpinning behind uh, we got a lot of uh, a lot of fans and a lot of press, not because we were fantastic at market uh, at marketing, because we, we certainly weren't. We had no skills in that area at all, but we had the best story in the business, and that led to really interesting things like um, like this image. Uh, so in 2009, Vogue did its first ever green edition, and and here we we were the key element, the the red belt. In this, uh, in this photo of Cameron Diaz, uh, which was taken by Mario Testino. It was a, a huge image to be a part of at the time. And Vogue, this is before really the advent of online influencers and things like that. The, the paper issue of Vogue, the actual magazine, was still incredibly influential. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this image kind of changed the trajectory of, of the business for us. So then you get to, let's say, fast forward, we start collecting the hose in 2005, now let's fast forward to around 2010. And the, the interesting thing was that by 2010, we were really able to start using the, the hose as we were getting it in. So the problem that we had set out, to dis, set out to solve, we were solving. And that meant for us that we had the bandwidth or the time to explore new problems. Now, we had never just been, let's say, a fire hose brand. Our packaging, our lining materials, uh, anything that ever went, went with the pieces was also waste. I think the only compromises we've really ever had have been zippers and thread. Um, everything else that we do is rescued. But we really felt by 2010 that we were ready to take on another big challenge. Mm -hmm. And the material problem that we decided to solve was the, the world's leather waste issue. So if you look at if you look at hose as a problem, it's not a big problem by comparison. So hose is three to 10 tons a year. We get three tons in a good year. And that's because it's generally gotten to the end of its health and safety life. We get 10 tons in a bad year. That means that we've had a lot of huge fires or huge events and a lot of catastrophic tears that are damaging hoses prematurely. But when you look at the leather space, it's very difficult to pin down a figure. Uh, the last time there was a, a, a study was in 2010. It was done by the UN. So about the time that we started looking at the problem. And they felt that the, you know, if they did all of their sums. That they looked at it being that the post-industrial pre-consumer leather waste problem was 800,000 tons a year. So suddenly, you know, we go from 10 tons a year to, eight, to wanting to tackle something that's 800,000 tons a year. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a much bigger deal. And the reason you have leather waste, I don't know if you can see the screen. Can you see me as well? Yeah, okay. we can see you as well. So you have a, a leather hide. It looks kind of like that. Mm -hmm. And so at the industrial level, they then cut out the pieces that they want. And you have all this negative space that falls to the cutting room floor. And sometimes that space gets rejected because of mosquito bites or stretch marks or uh, because there's a variation in the tan that they don't like. But often it gets it, it, it's just that they've cut out the big pieces and they're 
there's there's no small pieces required so you can imagine particularly in industries like a, where there's upholstery involved where they're really only looking for big cuts you have a lot of wastage and this is leather that has never seen the light of day it's freshly tanned it's spotlessly clean and it really needs someone to take a look at it and if you look at um, the image here in front of you what what I put together here was a kind of typical Elvis and Cressy design brief you know we don't uh, a traditional designer uh, would would study a, a very linear process you come up with an idea and then you go out and you acquire the materials to achieve that idea and you don't really care about what happens after the product dies it's a very linear pathway and it's why we have the linear system with regard to materials that we have mm -hmm. it's it's why you know people extract minerals from the ground make things and then they get thrown away or into the ocean and then the fish eat them and we eat them and, well, you know it's why we've got basically a crappy crappy terrible world in a horrible horrible situation and something needs to be done about it so our design method is completely different we start with the problem we bring it into the house we live with it for a long time and we try and understand every aspect of it you know what what is this material how much how much of it is there where is it you know the leather waste it's not like it's all in england of that 800,000 tons only 35,000 tons is in western europe a lot of the the leather industries are located in 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 pakistan in brazil in china in ethiopia it, this is a global issue so you then look okay where is this problem it's all over the world and it's in not uniform pieces fire hose is 22 meters long and very very uniform once you develop a system to recover it you can just keep going with that system leather all kinds of different thicknesses all kinds of different colors and all over the world and that's why this design brief that you see before you is uh, very different from a traditional design brief I wasn't asking Elvis to come up with products I was telling him to design a system I wanted him to create components that could be put together and taken apart because the only way we're ever gonna have a circular economy is if we design for deconstruction mm -hmm. which means you're thinking about the death of a product at the time of your design so I didn't I didn't expect him to come up with a product I expected him to come up with components and I wanted it to be fun engaging shareable I wanted it to have a life of its own life of its own is interesting because also your, your traditional designer there's quite a bit of ego there because there's this concept that I am going to create the most amazing thing in the world with the system that we have for leather my expectation is that the best thing that will ever come of the system will be come from someone else mm -hmm. we're just giving them the tools we're just enabling them to come up with it so those that was a design brief and what Elvis came up with was three pieces that you can interlock to essentially create whole new hides um, and I think the next image is trying to load here yes so the first thing that we were able to create was uh, was obviously two-dimensional leather rugs and you might look at this and, and obviously if you look close up you can see that there's a lot of small pieces which are woven together um, leather rugs might not be your cup of tea but the really interesting thing about this is that it can be repaired if you get a stain or a spot or a damage in one area you can take that piece out and replace it with something else if you have a high traffic area and a low traffic area you can swap pieces from high traffic to low traffic and keep the keep the piece going for much much longer if you don't want a rug anymore that's when the the design for deconstruction system really comes into a life of its own because you can you can simply take that rug apart and make something else and and here we have the next image you know you could make cubes which again might not be very interesting to you but it proves we can work in the three-dimensional system and if the cubes don't really excite you that's fine too because you can take those apart and you can say take a chair and you can reupholster the chair which hopefully should be popping up now it would be good if it was like right on time there it is um, and this is a, this is a lovely chair that we made for the circular house um, which was a design week project two years ago and the the wood for this chair is made of reclaimed scaffolding which a lot of people think is this not very good quality wood and I'm not saying it's oak but if you treat it like oak and you cherish it like oak and you coat it and coat it and coat it in and impregnate it in a hard wax oil 
you can you can absolutely elevate what what is uh, when once the scaffolding is dead a waste wood into something really extraordinary and then obviously you can see our leather as upholstery there and 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 then you go back to the idea that if you or we go right back to the beginning if you if you don't want your upholstery anymore you can make a bag yeah. and because you know we had decided from day one um, sorry that if you might hear a barking dog in the background that's uh, Monty very much our mascot and uh, clearly clearly someone's coming to the door because he has to hear us <laughs> off. Um, but what we because we'd always knew we were going to donate half of the half of the profits what we wanted to do particularly with the leather system because it's circular is we wanted to donate the money to renewable energy projects and there's a couple of reasons for that first reason is because cows and climate change are kind of inextricably linked so we we wanted to do something to redress that balance the other reason was that if we really truly are going to have a circular economy we can't run it on fossil fuels it has to be run on renewable energy and then you look at this image here this is our workshop in in kent in the uk and the reason uh, the third reason why we went for renewables, let's say, is because this this amazing workshop where where we are. This is a building we rescued in 2013. It had no heat, no power, and 22 rotten windows. Um, it was designed to run on renewable energy. It's a flour mill. Mm -hmm. that, that's a mill pond you see in the foreground. So for the first 150 years of this building's history, it ran on renewable energy, and then crazy people came along in the 50s and poured cement down the loose and concreted the wheel in you know and it's going to take it's probably going to it's we probably won't ever get the wheel going again because there's very weird hoops and permissions you have to jump through to to generate renewable electricity in micro hydro particularly when we're talking about you know i guess semi-private semi-public waterway anyway much more complicated than i ever expected it to be but the but everything led us down that pathway of thinking renewable energy was the way we should go. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, you know, you can, you can say, okay, we're a luxury business. And you can say that the, you could say that the, the most pioneering thing that we do is rescue materials and, and come up with new systems for them. But for us, it's much bigger than that. It's much more profound than that. We were never just trying to design a better bag. We were trying to design a better business or a better way of existing within the business world. And that's why I've got uh, an image like this together, which just has a lot of, clearly a lot of phrases on it. But, you know, for us, we are never seeking to do one thing well. We, we are out for multiple positive objectives. When I first came to the UK, I got invited to, to meet Al Gore, me, me and probably a thousand other entrepreneurs. So, you know, it's not like it was a one-on-one -on -one or anything. <laughs> Um, and he said he was promoting um, Inconvenient Truth at the time. And he said, look, we've got 10 years to save the planet. And when I reflect on that now, I think, okay, 10 years went by and very little happened. In fact, uh, because of the global financial meltdown, we probably went backwards in a lot of areas. Mm -hmm. And that's why multiple positive objectives is really important to me. We don't have time to do one thing well. We don't have time to just make bags. We have to change the world. We have to be completely different. And we, we, have to, we have to really, really focus on that, of being good at every single level. That's another reason why you see uh, two logos here. You know, we're a social enterprise. We always have been. We're, one of, we're a founding UK B Corp. And in order to be both of those things, you have to be achieving multiple positive objectives because those being a B Corp, being a social enterprise means that you're about much, much, much more than just money. You're about a community. You're about stakeholders. You're about a broader commitment to ending exploitation in the workforce and running an ethical business and solving social or environmental problems. And, and there's so many problems out there to solve that it, that it really kills me that, there, that, that businesses aren't falling over each other to tackle these issues. So multiple positive objectives is key. Um, the other thing that's key for us is uh, other people's grandchildren. You know, we, when you're in the sustainability space, there's a lot of rabbit holes that you can fall down. Is it better to use um, glass reusable bottles or plastic recyclable bottles? 
And actually, you just have to think of it. You know, you could, there is all kinds of studies and life cycle analysis that would, some will tell you that plastic bottles are better. Some will tell you that even, even if one of those plastic bottles escapes into the ocean, that glass bottles are clearly better. And what shorthand we devised to help us make some of these decisions is whether or not it makes the world better for other people's grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And actually you could make every single business decision this way. And we often do, you know, we're looking at, uh, you know, one particular customer, one particular project. Should we do this? If it makes the world worse for other people's grandchildren, then we shouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't ever possibly imagine Elvis and Cressy making landmines with this as a decision-making process. You couldn't ever possibly imagine Elvis and Cressy exploiting children and not paying them or not paying uh, apprentices properly. You couldn't ever imagine us doing that because an apprentice is someone else's grandchild. Mm -hmm. And so is, so are the, the, often the young people that work in, in garment factories in Bangladesh and you have to care for everyone. You can't just choose to care for people in one country. It kind of makes you think also about the pricing matrices of some companies. If you see a t-shirt that's for sale for five pounds, I can guarantee you that other people's grandchildren are going to be negatively impacted by that because someone somewhere is being exploited, whether it's the cotton farmer or the weaver or the person in the garment factory. There's just too many people and too many processes involved to ever deliver a t-shirt for five pounds. Mm -hmm. So please question that. Um, do more, be better is kind of our own personal model. You, you really need shorthand, especially, you know, it's freezing cold in the morning, it's raining outside and you've got to get up and go into the workshop. And, and, uh, and I'm telling you that gets me out of bed every single time. The equation that you see here, um, or the, the two figures, this ratio that you see here, 410 or 100,000 pounds, this is the only time you'll ever see me get excited about a financial metric. Mm -hmm. If you bury a thousand kilograms, so that's one ton of leather in the ground, it will cost you 410 pounds to do that. That's the landfill charge approximately. If we turn it into our system and we sell it, we can generate a hundred thousand pounds of value from that same ton of leather. So I'm, I'm not talking about marginal gain. I'm talking about an insane ratio that means that every ton of leather that goes to the ground is just craziness mm -hmm. and has to be stopped. And I think one of the reasons why we wanted to really push the boundary and really add value was to really show people why materials deserve to be cherished. And I sometimes think they wouldn't cherish it if it was, okay, bury it for 410 pounds or save it for a thousand. You know, I think we need to show people that there's extreme value being lost here. And if a company that's on our scale can do this, then this can be replicated for all kinds of materials all over the world. Um, we build to last, so like to make products that last a long time. And we find that that leads to increased loyalty. Uh, we have a hashtag, this is luxury, because we, we think that for too long, it's been up to a couple of industry players to tell you what luxury is. And I mm -hmm. think people should decide for themselves. We met a uh, amazing Arctic explorer and, you know, she's been trying for a long time to, to, to basically cross one of the poles on skis and sledges. And she can't because there hasn't been enough ice. Uh, luxury for her is ice in the winter time and it's a luxury that we will all have lost through inaction due, you know over climate change um we've got burberry up here because we we the burberry foundation we signed a partnership with them about uh just over a year ago to scale our rescue leather program mm -hmm. um it's very very wonderful of them to come out and put their hand up and say we have a leather problem and we're working with elvis and Cressy to solve it and it's it's been fantastic working with them. So this is just a, a page that I generally show people to highlight values. And then I always like to leave people with a picture of Elvis because they sometimes think with this business, they only ever get to hear from me. Um, but Elvis really does exist. He, he just doesn't leave the workshop that often. And I, and I don't think that I could certainly, certainly I know I couldn't run the business um, without him. And this is a, a, a great image for me because you got the, the full fire hose and the, in the bottom of the image, 
that's really really where we started the wash bag that he's holding is one of our best selling items like you know a wipe clean fire hose wash bag is clearly an ideal um an ideal product because you can wipe it clean and mm -hmm. if your toothpaste explodes you can sort that out relatively quickly and the belt that he's wearing there is the first the first belt that that we ever made and one that he wears all the time so that's a brief overview into Elvis and Cressy. And I don't know if there are any questions at this point. Definitely, I have lots of questions. I've been writing okay. down the notes. Okay, and I'm sure, great. yeah, I'll invite anybody who's watching um, to post your questions in the chat box and I'll come to those in a moment as well. If you've got questions for Cressy, that'd be amazing. Okay. Is that all right then? So I've got yeah. a few questions um, and they've covered so much there. So thank you so much for this. It's fascinating. Um, I mean, I've been following Elvis and Crest for a while, but even just listening to that, I've learned so much more <laughs> about Elvis and Crest. And kind of, I think what's really helpful is you really explaining the processes, the value that you have, and your real big vision around how you're running your business as well. Okay. Um, which is really exciting. Where I want to start, um, you were saying, you know, it's surprising, well, it surprises me, and I'm sure it surprises many people that are part of this summit, that... Um, existing businesses particularly in the fashion industry um, or who consider themselves luxury brands aren't already addressing some of the issues that you are seeking to address mm -hmm. i'm just interested because you're obviously engaging with that industry what is it in your experience and opinion that is stopping them from doing that because you demonstrate and other businesses demonstrate that it's absolutely positive possible and that there's huge value business value in it if nothing else <laughs> if they're not interested in the social and sustainable side of it yeah, I, I think there's a couple of things at play here. Always, I mean, you could say this is universally true in any sector. The in, the the old established businesses are are often, uh, you know, uh, the ones that can be disrupted. And the reason why they can be disrupted is that they tend to have fairly entrenched views mm -hmm. and 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 fairly solid self concepts. So if you have a brand that's existed for 150 years that does things in a particular way, it's not that easy to change. And it really isn't that easy to be radically different, you know, completely and totally and utterly different. That's one reason is, is just that, that pure relationship between sort of fresh starting disruptive businesses and incumbents. And then you've got, the other reality that's kind of unique to anyone in manufacturing, where if you're a big business in manufacturing, you're often no longer with your production. Mm -hmm. So if, you, if you're a car company or a fashion company or an airplane manufacturing company, you don't often have your point of manufacture happening right there next to your sales team with your directors all the time yeah. so you wouldn't necessarily be aware of these wastes building up or these inefficiencies happening they could be way down the supply chain you know one of the reasons in the uk why we had a couple of years ago this huge scandal about horse meat in a lot of the ready meals in supermarkets was was because the the supply chain around food is so complicated that you could say supermarket X would ask for a lasagna from supplier A, who then goes out and sources their ingredients from 20 different suppliers, who then have 20 different sub-suppliers each. These are very, very complex chains where nobody is quite 100% sure about what anyone else is doing. So it's not just unique to fashion. This is something that happens in food. And I remember thinking at the time, the issue for me wasn't, you know, Obviously, it's, you know, I, I love horses, but it wasn't horse per se that was the huge scandal for me. It could have been styrofoam, mm -hmm. could have been cyanide. They didn't know what they were selling us. That was a huge issue. And I don't think in fashion we necessarily, as an industry, always know what is being sold because of this hugely complicated supply chain. So I think that part of the exciting thing is is that when you have a brand our size working with a brand the size of Burberry, which is 7,000 times larger than we are, you have a unique opportunity to look again at the way everything is structured. And maybe you can't change everything overnight, but certainly you can have some very wonderful victories. Mm -hmm. And how are you seeing that? Like how is, you know, I can, I can imagine that 
you know, you are a very, in a really positive way, and I don't mean this negative, it's all, you are very disruptive, you know, you're, you're showing something is possible to an industry that, like, for all those reasons you've just explained, has ignored even just the waste issue, if nothing else. Um, are you seeing, you know, interest, obviously Burberry have shown an interest because they want to support and be part of that, and uh, it's, you know, great that they're doing that, but are you seeing other businesses, other industries kind of, coming to you or similar businesses asking for advice whether it's to do with design whether it's thinking about the social economy um, yeah yeah i mean we, we get we, we get some we get some kind of request every day now and i think that's the going to be the most difficult thing and sometimes those are requests from students wanting to know more about the process or from big business wanting to understand how it could apply to their waste streams or from groups of businesses that want to apply more circular uh, economy principles. So we, we, we get this kind of interest literally every day now. It used to be, it used to be annually in the beginning, then it was monthly, then it was weekly, but you know, I, I'm getting a random email uh, or phone call almost every day. And the, the difficult thing for us is that of course, you know, we're impact driven and we want to achieve multiple positive objectives, but we don't, we can't do all of it. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think the challenge for us as a business in the, in the next couple of years is really to work out how we can multiply the impact um, without completely bursting apart under the strain. I, I think that's going to be the biggest challenge for us now. And presumably one key part of that is helping people think through design better. And I know there's lots of, um, you know, whether it's in universities or in industry, exploring the design process differently and particularly building in this circular economy model, which I love the way you explained it in terms of um, thinking about the death of the project at design stage, which is yeah. simply, you know, defines it. Um, but can you see that whole economy grow? I mean, I'm very positive about these things and definitely, you know, you're providing that, that way forward. But can you see that happening in lots of different industries around the circular economy and that design thought process coming in at a much earlier stage for businesses design is we're still a bit behind on design you know there's still people getting away with linear design um we don't have any rules or laws or regulations about it we don't have any government incentives around repair you know there's it would be interesting for example to take VAT off of repair and restoration mm -hmm. and transformation it would be really interesting to see if we could if an incentive like that might work um, because there is still an awful lot of very very bad design out there I went to a um, I went to a, a show with one of the best product design universities in the UK and it was the final year show and someone had designed an, an appliance a totally unnecessary appliance that right now only exists at the industrial level and they were bringing it back to have like you know household ones just as if it was a you know everyone has a blender everyone has a dishwasher everyone has a washing machine everyone needs to be able to do this process at home as well and it was a, such a complicated design with so many moving parts and you could just see that it was um not going to be recyclable or 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 even really useful and it was really depressing to see so i know that design education has to improve i know that the that right now people think that the coolest amazing design is something that looks sleek or looks good and i actually think the coolest most aspirational design should be the the, the design that achieves the most impact yeah. we need to kind of have a cultural shift about what we aspire uh, you know aspire to be and what we believed to be cool or wonderful or amazing. So, so that certainly has to change. But one thing that's really exciting is that there's a lot of organizations getting involved in circular economy research in particular. And I was reading a document um, that was put out by uh, Citra, which is a, a Finnish organization last week. And they've done this amazing report on four materials, okay? So aluminum, steel, cement, and plastic, four materials. And in Europe, if we, in, if we took a circular economy approach to just those four materials, we could reduce our emissions by 56%, our carbon emissions by 56%. Mm, fascinating. Well, and I mean, it's, that, it's that kind of evidence that we need, isn't it? Because that seems yes. to be like, it's, it's, it's a huge business opportunity, if nothing else. Yes. For those of us that are super passionate about changing the way we um, live on our planet to sustain it. 
Yeah. But if you're just a hard-nosed business person, why yeah. are you not investing in this kind of opportunities as well? I don't know. I yeah. don't know. I mean, what are you waiting for? More yeah. forest fires? Yeah. You know, yeah. seriously. Well, no, I think that's that certainly came through when you were presenting as well. But it, what's really interesting in terms of the way that you've started your social enterprise is it's evidence-based. And yeah. certainly working with lots of social enterprises, they don't often see that. And I think that's really needed that you're kind of exploring and you look out for where there are materials where there's problems with those materials but also you're designing you know you didn't start out thinking about like you said becoming a fashion brand or designing bags necessarily or furniture or rugs you looked at the problem and then thought about how you could use that waste material yeah. um, in, in unique and different ways that you know adds value um, and i think again for me that's a completely different approach and a really positive approach for more social entrepreneurs to think about if they're looking to start any type of business like what's the problem and what's one what's different solutions to solve that problem not necessarily oh i just want to have a business that does this and i'm going to try and apply some um social and ethical standards to it how important do you think that kind of approach of focusing on the problem and using evidence to justify it at the start is, is important well, there's a, a really uh, amazing uh, woman who's done a lot of work with the school school of entrepreneurship. And she, what she was saying is that entrepreneurs need to completely change their approach instead of thinking about, OK, what business I'm going to create or even what's my solution mm -hmm. to a particular problem. The first step is that you need to understand the problem itself. And I think that 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 was that really helped us because we were looking at, OK, let's look at this fire hose problem how much hose is there where is it what is the raw material involved and then our solution you know we had certain expectations of ourselves we we're like we don't want to add a fraction of value we want to add enormous value we want to be as provocative as we can with this material because we're trying to prove a wider point around cherishing the resources that we have mm -hmm. um, and I, I can see a questions just popped up online uh, so given the, the logical arguments that stack up for this in so many levels what's the greatest barrier is it apathy or political agendas um, well I think it's you know it could be political apathy <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it, the, what kills what we do we definitely need a cultural shift we, we need that cultural shift to happen in the political space as well you know, in the UK, we do not have a single waste strategy that covers the UK. We've got 70 different waste strategies. Every, every local council can have their own waste strategy, which means that we don't ever go, you know what, we need a single policy on steel. We need a single policy on aluminum. We need to recycle these materials because that way we can, as you know, as we're still part of Europe now, we can reduce our overall emissions by 56 percent. We need to have these amazing, ambitious collective goals that everybody can get behind. And the way to do that is is by having some fairly out there goals that everyone signs up to. Sometimes I think politics can be helpful. Sometimes I think it gets in the way. Um, it gets in the way when when people think that we can be party political about something like climate change. Yeah. Really? You know, the, we're, we're either going to survive as a species or not. The, and, and there's nothing political about that. The science. Yeah. I, I think we sometimes need to step back from some of these existential threats and not take political approaches to them and, and rather say there are some things that we all need to just go and talk to the scientists about and then deliver on. Yeah. Um, and it will make it a lot easier to be basically there's the, the thing that helps apathy to grow within a, a society is when you've got lots of people fighting for the best way to do this, this, the best way to do this, this, my way or the highway. If we focus on, let's say, the science, the science based way of doing it and we all sign up to collective goals, I think we can achieve things a lot faster. Here, I'm just going to grab my power charger because I think. Um, I'm, I might lose, I think it's in the can grab, sorry, sorry. Um, we don't want to lose you. Yeah, no, it's, it's the video. I had full power, but I just <laughs> forgot to plug in. Um, but yeah, I think, so it, it's all of these things at once. That, that's probably the biggest issue we face, is that there isn't a single great barrier, which means there's, no, there's not going to be a silver bullet to fix it. Mm -hmm. You have to fix all of it, all at once. Yeah. 
which is not going to be easy, but it's worth trying to do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's yeah. another. Um, there's another question here, Cressy, in the chat box. Um, it says an amazing approach. So good to hear. I'm interested in how businesses get certified as a B Corp. Is it a difficult process, and does it bring benefits? Are there any corporate tax advantages, for example? Um, so it, it's it's to be a B Corp. Actually, one of the best ways into this is that you can go onto the B Lab website. Um, whether you're, if you're in the US or, or in the UK or anywhere in the world, and you can basically run through a series of questions about your business. Mm -hmm. And that's completely uh, free to use and it's completely uh, anonymous. So you can go through and really get a benchmark for where your business is, business is now. And when you go through that process, you'll realize where you can improve. Mm -hmm. So Elvis and I are obviously extremely strong on the environmental metrics, on the business model itself. Um, we are a little bit weaker in governance because we don't have an official uh, board of directors or, a, or an advisory board. Yeah. Um, we're not necessarily of the size of business where that's required, but you can imagine when, when, you're in a, when you're as a B Corp, what they really want to hear from you is that you're gonna be cementing these values and having a board that's, that's there to look, up, look after them is a very good signifier that that's something that will definitely happen. So is it difficult? Yeah, it is, and it should be because we don't we don't want to celebrate mediocrity. We don't have time time for that. But is it worth doing? Absolutely. There are there there are no tax breaks. <laughs> if there are tax breaks, and someone is listening to this and they know of tax breaks, share them with the rest of us. Um, but the what is what what the the value of it is is that. There's a lot of companies, especially over, we've seen over the last 10 years, who started to adopt the language that Elvis and I use, but not the behaviors. Mm -hmm. And what's amazing about being a B Corp is that we say what we do and we do it. And you don't even have to trust us that we do it because we, are, we, we get audited. You know, yeah. we get someone is looking at everything that we do. It's a very robust process and it's, and it's hard. Um, we also do open book accounting with our partners. So Firefighters Charity can look at our books. The London Fire Brigade can look at our books. Burberry can interrogate our books. So when we say that we're making these donations, we, we are. And you don't have to believe me. You can believe the people who we share our, our accounting, our accounting yeah. with. So we, we want to make it as transparent as possible so that people can really trust that what we, that what we say it, that, that we're doing is actually what we're doing. Yeah, no, and I think that's so important for any business as well, isn't it? That, that you know, because there is a lot of suspicion, and yeah. I, you know, and I think that's just a real shame in many respects because we, we as social enterprises, as the community, are under more scrutiny in, se in sense because there is still quite a lot of discussion about what ethical, sustainable, you yeah. know, means, and um, quite rightly, and that should be um, challenged and explored and interrogated. But I think if you're not open and willing to be open, accountable, then you know there, there's it looks like there's something to hide isn't there and there usually isn't yeah and, and the other the other thing is that it's an amazing co community of businesses that all want everyone to succeed so we've seen just we've seen our our trade just increase because uh, you know b corps want to buy from us and we want to buy from other b corps so it's a it's a fantastic community of businesses Fantastic. So I have two more questions and then I think we'll wrap up. So anybody else that has any questions, now is your time to ask them, otherwise you won't get the opportunity. Um, so my first question is really going back to you as a social entrepreneur, lots of social entrepreneurs are going to be watching um, this um, within the summit. For those that are maybe just starting out or have an idea around a circular economy model business, um, what are your sort of three top tips for them getting started or you know growing because you've been in this what for 13 plus years now yeah yeah um i'm knocking on the wooden table here um <laughs> you the i i still go back to that principle of of really understanding the problem so if you're trying to whatever the social or environmental problem that you're looking to tackle really be the world's expert at it know more about it than anyone else and try to really be to be focused on how you can create the most impact, how you can create the most value. Yes. So, so don't, don't worry if you don't come up with the best solution the first time around, keep 
looking at the problem and keep addressing it. You know, if I discover that there's a better use for decommissioned fire hose tomorrow, we will switch. That's, the, that's kind of the openness and willingness that you have to have. If you want to, if you want to stay innovative and if you want to stay interesting, Brilliant. that's, that's got to be the top tip. The other thing is, you know, just be, you're going to have to be resilient. You're, it's going to be tough. Yeah. <laughs> so just get used to the idea of things not working and picking yourself up and, and starting again, because sometimes you have to do that every day. Yeah. Thank you. And then the last question, which I'm asking all of um, my guests on the summit is, um, what's your hope for the future with the social enterprise sector? Um, and why do you think it's important that we support as consumers, as customers, more social enterprises and or, you know, support the whole sector generally as business owners? Um, my hope for the future is that, you know, right now we've got enterprise and we've got social enterprise. I hope that what we end up with is that we've got social enterprise and the rest of businesses will be called unsocial, exploitative, destructive, annoying dinosaurs that need to die. Mm -hmm. I, my hope for the future of this sector is that it is the business sector. Yeah. That this is how we trade. This is how we behave. And we, we deliver the world that we want to live in. We, we, are, we are the change that we want to see in the world. Yeah. Like you said before, there's no other option. You know, I see yeah. that with you, you know, because that's, that's the only option. Yeah, sometimes, I, you know, I've, one of my uh, best friends is, is, from, is, is, a, is a, the co-chair of, of B Lab in the UK. Um, and she is always saying, it's not binary, it's not binary, it's not black and white, but I sometimes think it is black and white. You have to decide, do you want to be a nice, awesome person or do you want to exploit things? Yeah. And, and I think it's okay to be black and white about something that's really that black and white. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. And it's really interesting, just as a final, to finish up, because one of the things you were saying, which I just will take away, and, and I'm sure lots of people will take away, is that thing about just thinking about somebody's grandchild. Um, and the reason why it really stuck with me, so for those people that don't know, um, I started as a social entrepreneur with my best friend. We run an education program in the UK, mm -hmm. um, which is essentially supporting kids to think about how they can use their science, technology, engineering skills to solve sustainability problems through business solutions. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we teach in the first initial day that we work with our groups of students, because they're only 11 to 14 year olds, is um, that very principle, because it's actually a... Um, North American, Native American principle, seventh generation principle, yeah. that you think about the seventh generation and the impact of every action that you have. And so, um, you know, these principles aren't new either. <laughs> They're things no. that have been around for centuries, millennia. Um, and I think it's important that we remember them because they have definitely been lost in our society. Um, and yes, yeah, so we're really I'm glad you mentioned that and I think we can all think about how we can run our businesses with just that principle in mind because it's so important. Yeah. So I don't think we've got any more questions, um, but thank you so much, Chris. It's been absolutely wonderful speaking to you and listening to you and um, hearing your story about Elvis and Cressy, um, but also your approach to business. And um, I know lots of people are going to be really interested. There's lots of comments coming through on the chat saying thank you very much. Yeah, cool. For this very cool. Um, presentation. So, um, yeah, thanks for your time and hope to speak to you again soon. Um, and thanks everybody who's been watching live as well. Excellent. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.